2015, an elite DFS Army Commando unit formed to bring high-level DFS strategy to the masses. Today, hated by DFS sharks and lineup sellers alike, they continue their quest to turn Joe into DFS Pro. Welcome back to another DFS Army Bold Call Podcast. My name is Alan Seslowski, a.k.a. Season Long Says, and sitting alongside me today is the fantasy football super freak, Seattle's own Matt Beck. Say hi, Matt. How's it going, everybody out there? I'm doing well. Season Long Says, how are you doing today? Good, good. Kevin Allen, a.k.a. the Fantasy Geek, he'll be back with me on a future podcast of Bold Call pretty soon. Today, uh, this podcast will be published on August 21st, and we plan on covering a wide variety, a potpourri of topics, if you would. Uh, but, you know, Matt's been on uh, the Bold Call podcast once already, uh, one of our most downloaded episodes ever to date. And uh, one of the, the most question, the most common questions I keep getting from Matt is they want to know, uh, some of the listeners, what is your general redraft fantasy philosophy for 2018? Oh, wow. So, yeah, we got a little bit of listener uh, Q&A here. So that's awesome. Um, first off, I want to say thank you very much for bringing me back and, and for saying that we had a, a highly downloaded pod. I'm really excited that, that it was successful, and I hope that we are as successful in our journeys. But um, redraft strategy this year, for me, I'm really, really trying something new out this year. If you listen to any type of fantasy information at all, if you do pods, if you listen to um, any TV shows, if you're um, if you're lucky enough to listen to you know like Sirius XM or any of the hardcore sites out there, this is what they're telling you: do not draft a quarterback. Some some of them are even saying don't draft one until just don't like you know until you get to oh geez i'll be fine with Mariota in the 14th round you know and and, in a lot of cases that that's what's going to happen yeah well you know it's i think the weight on quarterback thing it's it, it seems that it's been it's pretty common knowledge at this point and i think that uh, you're spot on to tell people to wait and and we can go into the reasons why but I think that even in the, your home league drafts at this point, I know you just had a home league draft the other night that I want to talk about in a little while, but aside from someone getting goosey and pulling the trigger on Aaron Rodgers pretty early, I think uh, the, the the common players at this point know to wait. Is um, is there something – well, let's go back to your home draft. How did it go down in, in, your, in your home league the other day? Um, so, where did the quarterback start going there? So, Sez, let me, let me tell you. I I'm not necessarily endorsing waiting on a QB. This is ah, what I'm trying to tell you. This gotcha. right here is the freak show strategy, okay? I am the freak and I will create this freak show strategy. What I'm saying, here's what I'm going to do to you. Okay? It says, let's say you're in, let's say you're even in an experts league. Okay, let's say you're drafting like you did recently with some of the best. Okay, I'm going to give you four names. Okay, and you tell me it's the seventh round and you tell me who you're going to take. Who do you like the best out of these four picks? Marlon Mack, Robert Woods, Sammy Watkins or Drew Brees. Yeah, I'm on board with you that. I'd rather in the seventh round when you're talking about speculative wide re- wide receivers and running backs, and then you see a player that you're going to just like Drew Brees that you're just going to pop in your lineup, and he's going to be there every week scoring points for you. I I tend to side with you because I'd rather choose from. I mean, there's a lot of like sleepers or value picks, whatever you want to call them, yeah, that I love from rounds nine through the end of the draft. So I'd rather be picking from those sleepers rather than and get a good quarterback 
then picking from the sleepers in the seventh round uh, of similar to the players you just named and choosing from a, a quarterback that just may not pan out at all. So uh, I think that's actually uh, pretty smart of you to point that out when everyone is saying, wait, wait, wait. There is a point because I and, – and just follow me on this. Tell me what you think. I think there's two strategies of late quarterback. There's late quarterback, which is what you kind of describe here, waiting to the seventh round. And then there's late, late quarterback, which is going for the Mariotas and deeper. So it sounds like you you prescribe to the late quarterback being that all of these QBs have now been pushed. Like the, the Drew Brees used to go in the second, third round. Now they're readily available in the seventh or tenth round. Well, yeah, and I mean, here's the thing. You, I want this podcast to be for all types of light in fantasy football. I want this to be the beginner, you know, that's that catches us and happens to stay listening. I want this to be for the hardcore. So we're going to have a little bit of content for both. In your home league, you're going to see quarterbacks like Aaron Rodgers go in the third or the fourth round, which is definitely fine. When that happens, take advantage of it. You know, when you get to the third or fourth round, they're picking Aaron Rodgers. That means Tyreek Hill's falling to you. That means, you know, you're going to pick up – you know, maybe someone like Mike Evans slips into the fourth round or something stupid like that because you got guys that are launching off QBs and when one goes, everybody's like, oh, well, I don't know, you know, I might end up with Patrick Mahomes if I don't grab Tom Brady right now, you know. So I definitely subscribe to um, getting the flow of your draft. I mean, if it, you know, I call it the bastard line. Look at your cheat sheet, draw a line between the the first 10 to 15 guys that you just love, love, love. If all those 15 guys just went off in a slew of just the 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 just the nastiest run of your favorite guys, then obviously, you know, go up. But I'm talking about I'm drafting with guys that aren't aren't normal guys, you know. When it comes to the seventh round and I'm looking at guys where, man, usually in my draft says I'm dominating by the seventh round of the draft, okay? Nobody's touching me by the seventh round. I've got three RBs, four wide receivers. They're all easy starters and and going to be great for me. So realistically, if I'm drafting a guy like Devontae Parker, like what are you doing? You know, what what's he even doing on my team? He's going to sit on the bench. I'm going to maybe, maybe play a matchup, maybe not. I don't know because I hate Devontae Parker this year. I'm probably going to just throw him back. And then what are you doing? You're wasting a seventh-round pick. So I look at it like, hey, let me go grab that tight end that everybody's let drop. Let me go grab that Drew Brees because he's going to be consistent every week to top off my monster start. Yeah, you you brought up an interesting point. In in the seventh round – It keeps coming up in our conversation here, and I think that's a point where the draft gets interesting. I mean, I I, I hear it all the time, and people are like through two rounds, three rounds. Oh, my God, I had an awesome start. I got Antonio Brown in the first round. I got uh, Devontae. I I, I got got Jerick McKinnon in the second round. Yeah, Devontae Freeman in the second round. I got you know Mike Evans in the third. Awesome start. But everyone has an awesome start through three rounds. I think – for experienced drafters like yourself and and this audience, I give our audience a lot. Uh, I think I'm gonna. I assume they're smart. I never assume that they're dumb, the, and that they understand that you, the ADP, with a few exceptions, follows the first three rounds. But when you get to that fifth, sixth, and especially seventh round, is where it gets interesting. And you brought up something about the tight ends. Are you a drafter? Because my original question to you was, what is your general draft strategy? Are you someone that uh, targets the elite top uh, top tight ends like Gronk, Kelsier, Ertz, or do you if it falls to you, you take it, or is it a hard pass for the first three rounds for you? First three rounds, hard pass. I am not even looking at the tight end position. Um, I'll tell you, we just like we said earlier, I've got my home league draft, and I mean. To be honest, it, it's a 10-team league. I'm drafting with semi-good players, but a couple of them are just, they're terrible. So, obviously, like I said, you're going to see the Russell Wilson in the third round because I'm from Seattle, whatever. But I, a homer I had pick. A, a homer pick, exactly. The You know, every league, it doesn't matter where you play, who you play, who you play with. 
you're going to have somewhat of a homer pick in there somewhere. And hopefully for you, hopefully for the average listener to this show, it's that guy in the third round so that you can take somebody else. But I usually am steadfast. This is what I'm trying to say to you, says I think this year is a magical year. It's a magical year for drafters who know what the hell they're doing. Because in home leagues, some of these guys, or even in in, in freaking pro leagues, running back or uh, sorry, running backs are going early, right? We know that. Quarterbacks are falling, and it depends on if you're a Gronk or a Kelsey guy somewhere in the third round. Maybe they sneak into the second round, but other than that, I'm looking at guys that I know are gonna dominate my position in that league, and those guys for me have lately been Drew Brees and Zach Ertz. In the right. the sixth, seventh, or eighth round, somewhere in there, I hate who is left on the board. I hate it. I there's so, not a guy that I love to pick that I'm just like, oh yes, you know, oh yeah, this guy, eighth round, this guy. I I'm usually picking that guy in the tenth round and I'm salivating. So in the sixth, seventh, or eighth, somewhere in that vicinity, I'm just not happy. With what's there, I'm just not. Uh, it, it pains me to pick up a Devonte Parker because it's like, yeah, I don't yeah, need I, him. I don't need him. So yeah, I think someone like Devonte Parker, I I think was going the eighth, ninth round uh, in the spring. Uh, I think that you know it, the the wool is out of most sharp drafters' eyes at this point. I think you're right spot on there. Devontae Parker has been crossed off my draft board, especially now with his broken finger. But I'm just looking at ADP and actually a a recent draft that I did uh, with um, some pretty decently sharp drafters. It was that Rotowire Online Championship League, and there were some some interesting names. You talked about the eighth round, and I'm not sure if this follows ADP or not, but these are some players that I'm definitely interested in. I'm curious of, of... of what you think. Now you're, you've mentioned Drew Brees a few times. He went solidly in the eighth round, but how about, uh, there's a couple players, uh, someone that I was not big on, but is moving up my draft board. Are you interested in Carlos Hyde? Yes or no. And why? Yes. 100%. And why? Because I do not like Nick Chubb. That's why. And that, why don't you, why don't you like Nick Chubb? I mean, he had, he was an early second round pick, basically almost a late first round pick. And before his injury, he was considered one of the top, uh, prospects. He hasn't shown well in the preseason, but you're just totally out on Chubb. I, I'm totally out on Chubb and I will tell you why I will find him in my ADP here and I will compare you to who else is going around him. And that's really where I am going to excel in a draft is where Nick Chubb is going off the board. Those at that time is exactly when I'm going to pivot from someone like Nick Chubb because here's the thing. Nick Chubb's going in almost every draft that I'm that I'm picking and and I can see why he's going. Um uh, my my thing though is I'm taking RB early and I know that that's kind of the consensus, but if you do it right and you should do it right, then you're going to have better opportunity to draft wide receiver late in the draft. But really what it is and I'll tell you this, I I'm from Seattle. I've watched Carlos Hyde for the last however many times. I loved him and I'm a Carlos Hyde truther. The second that he went to the Browns team, and then I knew that Tarod, Tarod is his name. Yeah. Once that, I that, found that's, it. <laughs> that's been that's been all. Tarod is is Trent. That like sort of pronunciation of it, where which obviously came from Hard Knocks, has been uh, trending on Twitter. It's been the top two Tarod spelt out phonetically uh, for the last couple of days. It's hysterical. So I, I love that you brought that up. Yeah, that's. I mean. That's what I'm just trying to say. Tarad brings so much to that offense that you saw it in the last preseason game. And I know I hate to overhype preseason games, but when the Browns offense is clicking, okay, in the last two preseason games, you've seen it uh, on the first uh, game. You saw Tarad clicking with Njoku. You saw Baker clicking with Njoku. A lot of stretch passes where you've seen a lot of seam tight end targets. That just opens up the run game. Huge. Yeah, Huge. That's, that's a good point. That's a good point. And there's so many thoughts swimming around my head. And you and I uh, don't get to talk too often. And I want to cover a lot of ground here. So 
I am going to um, fire some uh, – we're going to take pivots. We're going to go tangents. We're going to cover a lot of topics today. Pivot. Um, Pivot. Let's yeah. do it. Yeah. So um, in the news today, and again, I like to keep this as an evergreen podcast, but this is specific to today. Uh, you and I talked about a little bit over text that Adrian Peterson's carcass uh, was signed by Washington. <laughs> Are, do you have any interest in this at all? And if so – well, one, where, talk about Peterson and what you think he could be in Washington's offense, and where do you think he will settle in uh, being drafted, uh, c- accounting for name value and actual value? Yeah, so uh, the first question was, do I have interest in this? Yes, I do, but for Samaj P. Ryan. I don't have any interest in it for Adrian Peterson. I, I, do, I just don't think that offense um, – supports uh that that style of running i mean this this is kind of exactly why uh rob kelly has been uh just terrible i mean he is just terrible and here's the thing you 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 put rob kelly or you put adrian peterson on a different team that can utilize them in a different way they might look better but a guy like samaj p ryan um nobody's drafting him right now. I mean, you know, obviously some of the experts and, and a lot of the hardcore experts are just like me, you know, and I would, uh, sorry, I wouldn't call myself an expert, but you know, I follow that trend, but Saman JP Ryan, I mean, if, if he's available in the very last round of your draft, you should be picking him because, All right, well, well, I'm going to, I want to ask you a question here. So I just did a, uh, I told you, I just did a draft the other day. It was a high stakes draft. It was about $350 entry. I, I podcasted with geek with on it the other day. Uh, there was so, a couple experts in there, a couple just, um, regular sort of, let's call them Joe's, but, uh, sharp players. Where do you think P Ryan went? What round in a um, 20 round draft in a 20 round? Uh, knowing mm-hmm. that it was, you know, probably some of the experts, I want to say probably went in 10, round 10. You nailed it, brother. He went in the end of the 10th round. Yep, 10th round. See, that's that's exactly where if you're in an experts league, you got to draft P. Ryan. But if so you're that's in a actually homer a good, league, that's not, that's not that, it. Yeah, that's a good piece of actionable advice. You know, P. Ryan is, is not somebody, especially with the Adrian Peterson signing today, that's going to be on most, uh, most home league drafters, uh, sort of thought process. So I think that that's a good sort of lottery ticket at the end of your draft. I mean, no one's excited about him, but, uh, that could be one of those players where you're like, damn, why didn't I get him? So I think that's wise of you to bring him up. So just, just stick with the Adrian Peterson thing for a second. Where do you think that he'll settle in? Um, if we, if you were drafting today, where do you think he would go? Are we talking home league or experts league? Let's just somewhere in the middle, just some okay, sort of well, like, that, you know. I mean, I, I hate it. I hate it. But here's the thing. I mean, Rob Kelly probably went in the 10th round of my home league. So I would have to say name recognition is going to push him up into the 10th round. And here's the thing. I hate Rob Kelly. I would rather give the ball to Adrian Peterson any day. I think talent wins out. I don't think Adrian is that old, un, that uncompetitive at the position. I think you see a lot where older guys get some type of a run, and and who knows? I mean, Adrian Peterson, he sat out a year. You know, he's he's got a lot of fuel left in those Jets. And again, he's just, I just don't think he's went to this, the right top type of offense. I don't think he's in that type of offense here today, but I do think they did sign him for a reason. Now, maybe it's injury backup because obviously Chris Thompson's hurt. Uh, well, he's not really hurt. He's hurt and he's, he's back playing, but he says he's not going to be ready a hundred percent to like November. I don't think that's stopping the uh, Redskins from targeting him at all. Uh, especially in the preseason, which you would think if a guy's hurt, he wouldn't even be playing, but there he is one catch 17 yards or whatever it is. And, you know, he's going to get work. I think he's going to get a solid opportunity to have early down roll and early down roll. And I do think he wins out over Kelly when, when given an equal opportunity. The problem is he's not going to get that real solid equal opportunity until he gets about four weeks under his belt, just like a normal training camp. Um, So I would say week two, week three, you should probably see Adrian edging out some of that, 
uh, workload. So if you see somebody drafting Adrian Peterson now in the 10th round, let somebody else do it. I'm not going to do it. But maybe if the 14th or the 15th round squeaks by and I've got, you know, Naheem Hines or Adrian Peterson, um, even that's a tough decision, really, because, I don't know, Naheem Hines, he's he's electric, and if you get return yards, you know, that's great too. But I don't know, goal line work, I don't see it going Thompson's way, so... I don't know. I say they probably got to give it to AP, and he's probably going to sneak away with six TDs this year. Garbage. Yeah, I mean, I'll get. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's really a mystery. I, I'm I'm a total stay away at this point. If I miss out on that, that's fine. Like you said, in the, the last two rounds of final pick, if it's there, um, sure. But uh, another player that uh, that's a similar style, a lot younger, and a lot better situation. Who would you rather have straight up? Uh, Jeremy Hill uh, for this year only in a crowded New England backfield, but has looked good in the sort of goal line hammer role. Or would you rather have Adrian Peterson? If if you were in one of your last two picks, three picks, and you're kind of deciding for that fourth or fifth running back on your roster, which one of those guys would you take when you're on the clock? Man, you know that we are in a huge talk if we're debating between Jeremy Hill and Adrian Peterson. Well, you know what it is? I think everybody knows how to handle the first five rounds of the draft. They hear a lot of talk about these sleeper picks in the seventh through 10th round. But I always find what very interesting is that picking the right sleepers at the end of your draft, someone that can actually yield value. The the worst thing in the world is to pick uh, at the end of your draft a player that has like no upside. I know some people really are talking up Ryan Grant, and I, and I understand the reasons why, but it's like, what is that guy going to give you? And I, and I I could totally be eating you know eating my words, but I'd rather pick someone like an AP or a Jeremy Hill that could uh, you know be how Jerome Bettis was at the end of his career, where he just had like ten or twelve touchdowns and on like three carries for the game. Um, so that, that's why I think it's interesting to talk about these guys. Uh, so, so do you let have me, a, a, let me add in two other guys. Okay. So let's go Jeremy Hill, uh, AP, let's add in Frank Gore and Peyton Barber. Okay. Cause realistically, that's probably going to be the real decision. And at that point I would be sliding all of the older guys for Peyton Barber. That's probably yeah, a better yeah. pivot to go to if you're in a position where you could go AP, Jeremy Hill, Frank Gore, I'm going Peyton Barber at the end of my drafts. Yeah, I have no I have no problem with that whatsoever. Uh that that's that's definitely a good thought. I mean, he's the number 1 running back in Tampa Bay right now, right now, and he's being undrafted in most home leagues. So do you think that this precipitous fall of Ronald Jones the second, uh, the rookie running back that Tampa, Tampa Bay took early in the second round, and he is just diving down draft boards at this point with bad reports of camp. I mean, it, in the eighth, seventh, eighth round, if he falls that far, is is he someone? We talked about that eighth round, that dead zone seventh round. Are you are you still scooping him up, hoping by week three or four that he turns into something, or are you just totally passing on him? And, and grabbing a Peyton Barber in the double-digit rounds. Yeah, you know, in my home league recently, I did draft Rojo, and I I only did it because my first three picks off the board were solid RBs, and I'm really, I'm really kind of of the thought that one, you know, again, your draft should be completely solidified by round eight or nine, and again, like you said, it's it's pure upside for me after round 10 so I, I i went ahead and but in experts leagues you know that's where you're gonna have to take them as round eight and i i you know i don't uh it's just tough it depends on how the draft falls because i really would rather go around earlier on sony michelle than pick up peyton bar or uh, or uh rojo in the eighth I would rather Ronald step Jones. up. Yeah, I would rather step up around for Sony Michelle than um, keep in the eighth and say, "Hey, Rojo, that's that's where I'm going." All right, that's good. That's good. So you know, it's what uh, a lot of our listeners what what they like is they also they love value picks and sleepers. Now, I always 
have this argument with the geek, and I say there's no such thing as sleepers anymore with the internet and all the information and all of the different um, mediums, magazines, online uh, uh, journals, and blogs and and podcasts. There's there's barely any player that that people don't know anymore. But what are a couple of the players in the let's say eighth to twelfth round? So not like the end end of the draft, but the middle sort of where you're starting to pick those those sexy sleepers that you can tell the listeners the guys that they should be targeting in full PPR leagues. Okay, so eighth. Well, I think this. Well, guy even is... you know, even a little deeper. Even you can go to the thirteenth round if you want. Just giving you a wide net to cast there. Well, I think this guy, for some reason, has. I mean, he's been moving up boards, but he hasn't been just skyrocketing up boards. The guy that I'm. Let's even say eighth round, because I I would probably venture to guess that he's. He's going probably in that area, maybe eighth round, maybe seventh round. Um, but Marquise Goodwin, I mean, I am all in on Marquise Goodwin this year. And, and and there's, just like you said, there's so much content out there. But I got Marquise Goodwin in, in home leagues. Guys aren't drafting him. I mean, you, you'll, you can get him for nothing in home leagues. And please, please, if you're listening to this, Grab Marquise Goodwin in your home league and wait to do it until like the 12th round because you probably can get him in that round because everybody, they, they go by name recognition. Like you said, Pierre Garçon's going to go in the eighth round, which is great. Let, let him do it because realistically, uh, Jimmy Garoppolo, Garoppolo's number one target is Marquise Goodwin. And you can even see that. I mean, we're not even talking preseason hype because we look at the preseason, and unless someone scores a long touchdown or something like that, that's really where the hype comes in. But in the preseason right now, Jimmy Garoppolo, out of 18 attempts, has targeted Marquise Goodwin six of those attempts, which is 33% offensive share of targets, which that's a huge number realistically for a number two wide receiver or a perceived number two wide receiver. And that's something that that I'm going to jump on every time. Another name that I'd like everybody to really kind of watch out for to sneak but, up into the – go ahead, go ahead. Before – yeah, before you – I just want to respond on, on Goodwin before we move on. You brought up a good point. I think uh, Goodwin went from being, uh, like, like you said, a, an obscure name – to uh, a sexy, trendy sort of name, and I that's why I like doing early drafts because I think the curtain is coming up now. So you're smart to point out Goodwin is the number one receiver. That are facts at this point. He he led the league in, in yards per yards per target and yards per route run as uh, as well, I believe. But Goodwin at this point, uh, this draft I went the other night, he went five point eleven. Wow, was that in the yeah. experts league? Yeah, that was in the wow. Rotowire championship. And but you know what? On Rotowire, they are talking good one up every day. So that was one of those. Hey, look at me, plant my flag picks. Actually, you know who it was Chris List picked them in the sixth round. So uh, it wasn't five eleven, six one. And he he plant Chris List has planted a flag for Goodwin, and he definitely stuck to it. I agree with it. I think that that's the right spot for him, the sixth, seventh, eighth round. Like you said, in home leagues, he probably won't be necessary to do that. But if you're in a league with experienced drafters and you want them, um, yeah, you got to be aggressive on with them, especially if you're picking on in the in the first two spots, the last two spots of your draft. So, uh, well, inter- let's talk inter- about ball. let's talk about preseason production, right? So, obviously, I think there's uh, right now if you listen to any of the experts or consider yourself a, a pretty big uh, drafter, uh, know what Sharp, the hell you're like talking a, like about. A, like a sharp player you're talking sharp, about. Sharp, sharp, yeah, sharp. There are two guys I think right now that are skyrocketing up expert sports but still will not be touched in home leagues. And one of them, you got to give it to him, Taewon Taylor has not only been producing but right now is going to be their number two wide receiver. And last year everybody was on Tajay Sharp and that was – that was a pretty big blunder of of was that last, last year. year or was that was that last year? Or was that two years ago? I thought it was last year. I but I could I be wrong. I don't remember. But I nobody remember remembers. <laughs> oh He's my done. god! That was 
I mean, I, I, I didn't never understood it, but I, you know, it was one of those things where I was like, should I get a share? You know, maybe I, I got one in the best ball league in my rookie draft. He went like in the mid first round. I remember that was a bust, but I agree with you. Um, Taiwan Taylor is, 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 is my most owned receiver in through 61 best ball drafts. Um, I, and I used to take him with my last pick. You're right now. He's going in the um in the in the double digit like the early double digit rounds now. I think that that huge game that that 90 yard and two touchdown game um opened up uh, everyone's eyes. So another another great pick. And for home leagues, I still think he could probably be taken in, in pretty close to the end. Th- these are great ones. You you've picked two superstars. How about a running back? You gave me two um home run wide receivers. Is there you know the people are attacking running back positions super early this year, Matt? And it's leaving the cupboard a little bare once you get into the seventh round. I mean, people are reaching up to the sixth round for Marshawn Lynch, and it just gets naked. What do you see in the in the tenth round, or that, let's say the ninth round or later, that that could be a number two or a flex fill in at running back? Well, I, I you know it's kind of tough because uh, you know when I when I when I talk about fantasy football. You know, I, I listen to the experts. So I could have said, and I've been touting this guy's number from the very beginning, but I could have answered this question three weeks ago with Chris Carson, and everybody would have said, uh, F you, they would have threw tomatoes at me. Rashad Penny's going to, you know, we're drafting Penny in the fifth round. Carson's not even worth it. You know, now you see him in experts leagues going seventh round, you know, eighth round. And so that would have been my answer, but obviously I'm a homer truther of Chris Carson, and and I think everybody's smartening up to him, although he did fumble on the goal line twice, uh, which was not not encouraging, but he's not known for fumbling, so I'm not... Yeah, he was- he was good in those in those in those few games that he played last year. He looked the part, didn't he? I mean, there's all the numbers, there's the metrics, uh, and all the all the data and, and analytics that people look at, and then then there's the eyeball test. I mean, I, I think that when you, when you're baking in uh, your pricing and your ADP, I think the eyeball test is is should act as a significant slice. So uh, Carson looked good to me. I, I in, in a in a podcast that we did in the spring. Um, we, we brought up Carson. I liked him. Um, I definitely I agree with you. I was met with some resistance. So I think that's a really good one. But like you said, he's creeped into the single digit rounds and deservedly so. I think he's appropriately priced in the eighth, seventh, or eighth round. So I would have to answer this question uh, pretty firmly in, in my eyes with if if we're really talking late round right so let's say somebody did zero rb so if they go zero rb realistically they've got about three or four running backs in that middle tier guys um that that they've gone with but for me i gotta say james white i mean oh that's a good one that's a good one because here's the thing Dion lewis is now going in the sixth fifth round fifth round sixth round this year and he's going off of the pure hype from Tom Brady and being able to target the running back out of the backfield. You saw from the last preseason game that nobody targets the running back out of the backfield like Tom Brady. Sonny Michelle's injured. Rex Burkhead is injured. You got two old, old, over the Jeremy Hill running backs in Gillisley and Jeremy Hill as your real one-two uh, down backs, but realistically, even that is is not coming to fruition because you saw James White with a heavy target share in that last preseason game running with the ones. There's no, I mean, there's no way Julian Edelman out for the first four games of the season if Michelle doesn't get back till week two. If Burkhead does, oh, well, he's Burkhead's practicing, but if he doesn't make it onto the field, you're gonna see James White winning daily fantasy, uh, big big pots because he's yeah, no, that's uh, underpriced. Good. I mean, gee. Yeah, no, that that's a good. And then James White a couple years ago in the Super Bowl, um, you know, he should have been the MVP. I mean, they don't give the MVP to. Uh, running backs that often, they, I think they ended up giving it to Brady. But uh, yeah, no, he he was an electric player that on limited touches can really light it up. You you brought up Deion Lewis, and Deion Lewis was was really great in the Patriots system. He was actually drafted by the Eagles, and I think he might have even played uh, for the Browns. I'd have to look that up. 
Uh, he made it around. The, he did the rounds. He was on a few teams before he ended up in New England. Is it possible that Deion Lewis is a system back and that he's going to fail as a fourth round pick in drafts this year on Tennessee? Are you well, drafting Deion Lewis? Yes, I am. I am drafting Deion Lewis. Me too. I mean, and and I'm happy to draft Deion Lewis. I think I'm just as happy to draft Derrick Henry, and I think that's kind of the – that's like – it was like that time or that period of time where uh, Jarvis Landry was being drafted after Josh Gordon. So I feel like that Derrick Henry, uh, Jarvis Landry, they're moving up to where they should be now because they are more consistent ideals of what you want at the position. But if you go zero RB, I don't think you can get a guy like Derrick Henry as your one because you realistically need some additional oomph to really kind of uh get that from your know you know number one or your number two rb but um i i'm drafting him but yeah he's a system back he's gotta be i mean when you're drafted as the pass catching back i mean you're gotta understand that you're not there to take the first down chair so that's a system in itself just being a pass catching back so it's just a matter of if we're gonna see the new regime target him and and you got to think you're going to with the new head coach coming right from that system so you gotta uh, you gotta see that right and you know i i i don't i don't understand why we why we think that Dion lewis isn't going to be productive i know some guys are a little scared but he is definitely going to be productive uh, okay, so system? so was it so right there? So you're taking him in his fourth round ADP if if the situation's right. So another question that I like to ask people to come on the pod is, you know, you see a lot of a lot of different sort of bold call. What what you know, and some of these like unrealistic. Uh, hey, Carlos Hyde is going to lead the NFL in rushing. I mean, that's of course any running back could lead the NFL in rushing. It's not like wide receiver, but you know, if he gets 350 carries, he could do it. But I want to ask you the opposite question. Who is a, a player that is perceived as safe, that's being drafted in the first three rounds, that you just, for no good reason, you just have a bad vibe on and that will likely bust? Just like okay. someone that every every time they come up, you're just like, no. Someone in the first three or four rounds. Well, I, I've got... I... I've got two, really, and 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 I'd love to. I don't necessarily want to spend a lot of time on this first one, um, but I did draft this guy, and I know a lot of people like him. I just, uh, I just, I'm not too sure how I personally feel about him, but but I'm gonna say Devonte Freeman. I mean, I like him, I do, and and I do like his his always consistent playing, but I just don't get the vibe that the team really feels like he's going to be just that give it give him everything he's going to be able to take a guy I mean there's no way that Tevin Coleman hangs around that offense for that long if, so you don't like you don't like Freeman though you, you think that they're good I mean they're locked into Freeman with a with a big contract Coleman's is going to be a free agent at the end of the year I mean uh, uh, Freeman, I feel like has a safe floor, but you think that well, this that's is it. your guy. Floor. He's got a safe floor. I mean, right. but I'm that's... talking about is there is there a player in the first few rounds that you think that's perceived like a De- Devontae Freeman would be exactly what I'm talking about? A player that has a perceived floor, not like a huge ceiling. He's a floor pick, but that you think might just totally fall through that floor. Is there anyone that scares the hell out of you in the first three rounds? Uh, Jarek McKinnon. Oh yeah, is oh, another yeah. one. I mean, he's. You don't I hate think, drafting you don't, him. You don't think people are going in with their eyes wide open on Jarek McKinnon? You don't think that they th- he's being drafted for his upside and they know the floor is terrible? No, because I think that they are buying into the hype of the offensive scheme that uh, here we go that Devonte Adams was a part of, right? And so maybe maybe here I am. Maybe I'm just I mean, skeptical about that scheme. About- you're talking about Devontae Freeman, right? Oh, Devontae Freeman. Clear. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, Freeman. So yeah, yeah. M- maybe I'm just skeptical of that scheme being 
exactly the same production value going to a different team. And am I, am I, Am I a little bit am I a little bit crazy to say that Jimmy Garoppolo is better than Matt Ryan ever was? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, a much smaller sample size and Matt Ryan was a league MVP. I think the body of work um it's I mean that season that Matt Ryan had his his yards per attempt were I mean, I don't know the number offhand, but it was well into the nines. And that was just an historic pace. So if you're talking about Matt Ryan's outlier MVP season or Matt Ryan's uh, sort of average, I mean, there's definitely more upside with Garoppolo. I don't think anyone would call you crazy about that. But Matt Ryan did have a ceiling season that was insane. Um, well, and he's I, going, and he should when he has such a prolific number one wide receiver. He should. Yeah. But here's what I'm saying about Garoppolo and Tom Brady. These are types of quarterbacks that are just so amazing that you don't need to put the amazing, just the prolific number ones around them for them to be good. I think Garoppolo is great enough to be able to take guys like Jarek McKinnon, who, you know, Jarek McKinnon's a great player, but he's not. He's he's not Alvin Kamara. You know, he's no. he's not guys that are just these really oh my god players like saquon there's nothing you know marquise goodwin is a freaking straight line track star you know yeah Pierre but, Garçon. but here here when you're when you're talking about mckinnon though it's like he's had the opportunities before i mean he was he was one of those workout metrics guys that was off the chart the spark guys but he's had opportunities i remember a couple years ago when adrian peterson went down i was like oh my god hundred dollar fab bid it all on mckinnon and he didn't do shit like i i've drafted mckinnon you know, cards on the table in the best ball leagues, I've taken him. I've taken him in the second round. I, I've backed off since the injury. Um, so I think that's that's a good a good pick in the first three rounds uh, pertaining to my question. Who do you got? Who, who do you who, answer your own question there? Yeah, I mean, I think mine mine's going to surprise you because they're, uh, I'm going to pick a wide receiver who everyone – perceives as the safest guy to draft in the third, fourth round. But I think – Golden Tate is uh, going to be a major bust this year. And I know that, you know, everyone's like, wait a second. He's good for 80 catches, 1,000 yards, and six touchdowns. I think that the more I've been looking at this, I think they're going to get Kenny Galladay on the field with Marvin Jones and go Twin Towers. Golden Tate's going to be in the slot, and he's going to get his. I mean, Matt Stafford throws the ball, um, you know, close to 650 times, sometimes even more. Uh, I just think that people that are drafting Tate, in the third, in the three, four turn, expecting to have this rock solid two are going to be disappointed. I think Tate is going to have every week starter fantasy value, but I could see his receptions dropping to about 70, 68 receptions, thousand yards and maybe three touchdowns. So I'm a little skittish on who's been uh, on Golden Tate, who's been a rock solid third, fourth round pick for the last five years. Yeah. You know, that's, that's actually a really, really great. Uh, thing because that's a, this this that whole answer transitions into my uh, next thing I was gonna say, but let me park it real quick. An arbitrage on an arbitrage on Golden Tate, okay, is Brandon Cooks. Let's say they have similar production this year. You can get Brandon Cooks two rounds later. So why even draft Golden Tate in the fourth? It just it doesn't make any sense to me at all to do so and this is what i'm going to say there's this crazy presence among the nfl that these speedy wide receivers who are a little undersized and i'm, I'm talking about stefan diggs brandon cooks ty hilton deshaun jackson until recently uh really emmanuel sanders is another one uh, is it just me, or does it not make way more sense to move the small wideouts, even though they can be productive going down the field? Does it not make way more sense to move them to the slot? And this is what I'm just not understanding. This is why guys like Golden Tate, I mean, their production can only be so much. I mean, these guys they're going to be met with the oversized corners 
And I'm a little guy myself, my friend. I cannot get by a lot of these older guys. <laughs> Are you there, Alan? I'm here. I'm listening. I'm, I'm, I'm really taking it in. I think that uh, – so what you're saying is that – you like when when receivers are in the slot, like especially if they're not the six four, you know, uh, six four, uh, two hundred and thirty pound track star type. You like when you see uh, a six one, two hundred and fifteen pound receiver like Sanders and all those guys in the slot. Yeah, I mean Sanders. I I just feel like let's look at a couple teams that do put the little guy in the slot. And let's judge that, that guy's production. And you look no further than Julian Edelman. Okay, That dude is a true slot receiver. Yes, he probably has speed that can burn some of these guys deep, right? These bigger, slower guys. But I think the more big, the bigger matchup is not to burn a 6'4", 230, or, you know, 225, 230 uh, DB who has speed too. You know, maybe they're point two slower than, than you know, Cooks, who might be point four faster. That's not as big of a matchup as put him in the slot and match him up with the linebacker, you know. So so ha- so how can we turn this, that, that very interesting, and I think it's a pretty cool observation, uh, how can we turn that into actionable fantasy uh, like value? Is there should we start looking for for on depth charts of receivers that are going to be working at both the outside and the slot, or should we be targeting guys that are exclusively there? Um, how can we how can we turn that into an our advantage when we're drafting? So here's how we do it. We look at guys like you said that are undersized that do play the slot role. And I will say that this is a big reason why Antonio Brown is is as productive as he is because he does play in the slot a lot. And when he slides to the slot, he goes away from the number one corner. And that's a big matchup unless they shadow him, which nowadays is a lot of the case. But when you look at guys like um, I'm gonna I'm gonna go the backwards way too. So guys like uh, let's stay here, uh, Randall Cobb. Okay, he's a slot guy. He's no he's no longer realistically playing on the outside now. He's older too. But now let's look at Larry Fitzgerald. Realistically, Larry is doing amazing ever since he moved to the slot. And I'm yeah, Larry, I'm to, Larry Larry Fitzgerald. He's like a glorified tight end at this point. I mean, he's he's getting almost you know he's going he's he's catching a, a shit ton of, of footballs, but they're for short gains. But in a PPR. You know that pays the bills. Not, you know, 85, 9,500 catches. I mean, which is it, which he's getting. I mean, it's crazy at this age. So I agree with you that and touchdowns. Uh, I mean, yeah. a lot of the times out of the slot, those guys are burning those uh, linebackers through the to the sidelines. I mean, you're coming from the left side of the field. You're gonna burn that linebacker all the way to the sideline to the right. Yes, like give me that yeah. guy in a touchdown. So here's where I'm going with this. If you're not drafting Jordy Nelson. Okay, somewhere under the first 10 rounds, I think that you're wrong. I mean, I understand he had a terrible year, right? But Rodgers, Rodgers was injured at at points. And, you know, yes, Devontae Adams did just as good uh, with the other quarterback there. Forget his name off the top of my head. But um, I think Jordy Nelson's going to play a lot in the slot this year. And I think that that is a little bit. That's a really. That's a good observation. So people, because Jordy's being undervalued, and um, so I, I think that's that's a very interesting strategy point, which actually ties back to my original question: is uh, some overlaying strategies. And I want to get into to more of this. Um, what we're going to do is, as you can see, Matt and I, when we talk, it's just crazy. Both both of us, we love fantasy football so much. We eat, live, and breathe this stuff. We we've been texting all day about this stuff. Uh, very excited to do this podcast. I know we've covered so many topics. Our future podcasts are going to be a little bit more focused. We're going to do another one real soon. Uh, we're almost at the end right here. So, Matt, I, I want to thank you for coming on, man. You, I love having you on. I just there's anytime I'm talking to someone that's as passionate about fantasy football as you are that bleeds this stuff. It just it, it makes the hairs on my neck stand up. So, uh, as, as long as you're willing, I would love to have you back on again real soon. Yeah, let's let's make this a common occurrence. Uh, my last thing to kind of end, and I think this is nice. I mean, if, if somebody's got a draft, because I'm probably seeing this as a weekly thing. So if somebody's got a draft this weekend, uh, says uh, you're going to start first, give me your 
fantasy must draft and your fantasy must stay away from. This year, if someone's going into a draft this weekend, home league, expert league, whatever, who should they draft and who should they stay away from? Yeah, I mean, we, we talked about a couple of the stayaways. Um, I, I've crossed uh, Jay Ajayi off my list. I just I don't understand it at all. Um, if Not you're gonna lie, you for, took my answer at running back. I'm so upset. Uh, all right, all right. So I'll th- you know, so then you have to come up with. You asked me first, so you have to think of another <laughs> one. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't I don't get it. You know, a, a non pass catching running back uh, who's in a committee in the fourth or fifth round. I'm not sure I understand it. And a must go get. I, I mean, it, it, looking down the draft board a little bit, um, I think that I've been targeting uh, Trey Burton. I know he's a trendy name at tight end, and I'm a little sort of confirmation bias with him because he is on my dynasty team. I picked him up uh, off the waiver wire last year knowing he was going to be a free agent. So Burton is a guy that I'm targeting for my tight end. I think he finishes as a top four guy. I love that. I love that. That's, I mean, that's fine. Yeah, I know he's a trendy pick, but I, I believe in it. I'm, I'm really all in on it. That's, that's great. So, uh, How about my, you? My, so my must have, I think this year, um, I'm really pretty high on David and Joku. David yeah. and Joku. I, yeah, he I looked just, good. He looked good in those preseason games, didn't he? Catching those passes, uh, yeah. those end zone passes. And yeah. and he. He is a monster. He is just such a monster. And if that offense, I can. The only way I could see Njoku not finishing top twelve this year is if Hugh Jackson just decides he wants to not throw the ball to him. I I think because Hugh Jackson sucks. You know what I mean? Like that whole the the suckiest part of that whole hard knocks thing is that they're not letting these guys play like with just this this furious hype. Like just let these guys go out and play ball. Like don't even coach these guys. Like you're 0 and 16 for the last like 20 years. Like your fans just want to see some hype. Just get slinging the yeah. ball. Just start run. Like who cares? Like stop trying to coach these guys. Like honestly, just let them do what they do best. Like just go out there and sling that ball, dude. And and if they don't target Njoku, I'm going to I'm just man, you you are failing as a coaching staff, yeah. and they have and a lot, a, a lot, of, a lot of good toys over there. A lot of good toys, and so, so both of us are scratching the jolly off. We both have uh, those the tight ends. Ironically, we both like. So that is an awesome place to end it. Good fantasy advice. Love having you on, Matt. So remember, everyone, DFS Army Bull Call Podcast. We're going to be doing it a lot more often, uh, including a waiver wire podcast once we get into the season. Uh, everyone go check out DFSArmy.com, sign up, become a premium member over there. Uh, they, they have the best daily fantasy advice. Uh, Matt and I are going to be adding season-long content to their to that website, and uh, we'll be talking. You could tweet at us. We'll put uh, Matt's Twitter handle in the show notes. You could tweet him. He loves answering questions and interacting. He always has great opinions that are that go against the, uh, the consensus, and you could always tweet at me too at Alan Soslowski. It will be in the show notes. All right, brother. Until next time. Thanks a lot. It was great talking to you. Stay freaky. Thank you for listening to the DFS Army podcast. Join the DFS Army today and gain access to our private Slack chat, where you can chat with real DFS pros and coaches, as well as other DFS Army members with winning track records. Also included in your membership is access to our premium articles, DFS Army weighted projections for every sport we offer from nfl to mma weekly player picks and cheat sheets the strategy vault of timeless concepts and the dfs army domination station a truly state-of-the-art lineup optimizer offering your personal projections or ours the dfs army membership is the best value across the industry join today and get two free ebooks as well as the secrets to to unlocking a new level to your game.